Good morning and welcome. I'm Susan Smith. You are in my studio, Stitched by Susan, here in Spokane, Washington. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous sunny morning, enjoying wringing the last bit of enjoyment out of summer. So this is Live and Unscripted, where I will be quilting an edge-to-edge -edge quilting design from beginning to end of a quilting project. Um, yeah, so if you are newer to long arm quilting, you might find this super helpful because I like to talk about less about the specific quilting design and more about the big picture. So decisions that you need to make when you're quilting. And I know early on when I was first learning to quilt, I had such difficulty finding this sort of information because few people show kind of behind the scenes in the YouTube videos and obviously it's not very easy to pick up my long arm and go quilt with a friend, right? So lots of the little decisions that you just don't even know you've got to make till you start quilting, like what thread to use and does it matter if you put the backing on right side up or sideways and how do you keep the quilt square and all those sorts of things. So we'll be talking about a few of those today. I'm going to be quilting um, one of my own designs. I call it Crazy Eights. You'll see why when I get quilting. And it's kind of my favorite type of design. It's very repetitive um, and kind of mindless actually in quilting, but really effective texture on a quilt. So yeah, let's get acquainted a little bit before we dive into the quilting. Who's watching this morning? My husband Dave is behind the scenes running all your names on the screen so I can see them and greet you all. He's just making the screen big enough for me to read. Um, someone from Denver, Colorado, Red Wee 4. Don't know what your first name is. You might want to chime into the chat window and then I can call you by name. Um, so good morning. Penny from Minnesota. Barbara from, got to take my glasses off to read the screen. From Minnesota, also coffee in hand. Me too. Cheers. <laughs> Wanda, beautiful day in New Hampshire. Fantastic. Good morning from Hasbro Heights, New Jersey. Wow, not many of you this morning. Hopefully more people will be chiming in. There's more people there than just not saying anything. Ah, my husband is saying there's lots more people there. They're just not saying anything. So, you know, say good morning. Monica from Central Minnesota. There's a few of you from Minnesota this morning. That's great. Maybe it's good timing for you guys. Um, hi from Southern California. Great. Well, it's great to be quilting with you all. As you may or may not know, um, I've been away the last couple of weeks. We actually made a trip into Canada where a couple of our grown children live and our only granddaughter. So we had a really great time visiting there. So I haven't quilted with you for quite a while. I'm happy to be back. Sue from Nebraska is chiming in. Lovely weather here. And Kim from South Dakota. So good. Hazel from Arkansas. And S. Powers from Oklahoma. And Pat from Vermont. Wow, you guys have got the U.S. well represented here. I haven't seen any fellow Canadians yet. Darlene from Montana City. Is that Montana City? Must be. So, so great to be with you all. Okay, let's get talking. So just a couple things before we dive in. If you do have questions, type them into the chat window at any time. If you put a capital Q or a question in all caps, that helps us if there's lots of people commenting to go back and catch the questions. And I'll kind of stop at each advance of the quilt um, and answer some of those questions. So feel free to ask. No question is too small. I'm happy to talk about what I'm doing. Um, this episode and all of my YouTube ones are obviously free, but if you're interested in supporting what we do, you can simply go to buymeacoffee.com and there you can make a one-time contribution that just helps us upgrade some of our equipment. Um, in our very last episode, I talked a little bit about the new camera that we just purchased and it's the one that's doing the close-up of the stitching on Lucy the long arm. And so that was all done with you folks' contributions on Buy Me A Coffee, and I really appreciate it. It is our goal to keep improving um, our live stream. And Dave and I are amateurs. It's just a thing that we do together, and we're learning as we go. So we appreciate your patience and your support for sure. So that new camera has been really helpful. It is particularly geared toward um, dealing with vibration and getting a smoother and clearer picture for you. So that's always our goal to improve. I should mention too, I am quilting on a Gamel Elevate 
Mine has a 26 inch throat, so it has lots of quilting room. I do a lot of quilting for other people and a lot of edge to edge designs. So efficiency is kind of my, my motto. So the large machine really helps with that. A um, few more people chiming in. Charity from Minnesota. And Mickey from the North Georgia Mountains. Mickey, you are a faithful follower. Thank you and watcher. Appreciate it. And a couple of these we've seen. Oh, Barbara, Canadian by heritage, if that counts. Of course it counts, Barbara, because that's where I'm at too, right? I'm living in the U.S. currently, but still Canadian. I'm sure you can hear it in my voice, eh? <laughs> okay, so let's get quilting. What have I not talked about, Dave, in my rambling? Um, oh, one more watcher. Ann Stone saying hello from Cincinnati. We really do have the U.S. well represented today, for sure. So we've done buy me a coffee. What else am I missing? Hmm. Like and subscribe and $4,000. Oh, yes. One other thing I wanted to mention. You guys have been watching and so encouraging with these YouTube videos. When I look back at some of my earlier ones, they were sure uh, rough around the edges. So I appreciate that you have stuck with me, with Dave and I, as we're learning how to do this. So I wanted to mention we this last week we hit 1,000 followers, which is kind of a benchmark in YouTube algorithm, I guess. One of their other benchmarks is 4,000 viewed hours. So we're just a couple of hundred shy of that. So I would love if you guys would help by turning on some of these YouTube videos that I've done while you're working maybe in your quilting studio. And, you know, most of them are two or more hours long. So it doesn't take all that many viewers to garner a few more hundred hours. So I'd appreciate if you do that. That'd be great. And help me hit that sort of benchmark on YouTube. And what else? Today's topics. Um, obviously, it's a freehand design, but I kind of wanted to focus a little bit today on how I float my tops. That's not a term that's familiar to all quilters, but I'll talk about that. And also how I progress throughout the quilt to keep them square or to make them square if they aren't when I start. So that's kind of the overarching um, topic for today. So let's get started. We're going to move Lucy off to the right. Okay, let's get started. So today's quilt, um, and I keep walking in and out of camera to get my things. Let's talk just a wee bit about backing. Those of you who have watched before know that I frequently load my quilts sideways, so the length runs along my quilting rails, and I only do that for efficiency because that means it's shorter this way, and therefore I have fewer advances and passes on the quilt, right? So when I can, I like to load my quilts that way, but there's a few other things that need to be considered when you're deciding which way to load your quilt. So let's talk about a couple of those. Today's backing, can you see it, is directional. It has mustaches and top hats. So I need it to be, you know, top to bottom on my quilt. Now, if my quilting design is not directional, that doesn't prevent me from loading it sideways, but for today's purposes, I'm doing this crazy eights design and I want the eights to be up and down. I don't want the eights to be crosswise. Does that make sense? So I am in fact gonna load my quilt right side up today. So that means I need to make sure that my mustaches and top hats also are running the same direction, right? I don't want my quilting design to go one way and my directional backing fabric to go the other way. That would not be pretty. So that means I did have to piece my backing. Here's the seam. Okay, so that means my seam is going to run vertically. And that is not my first choice. It's easier to load straight and smooth with the seam running horizontally. But as I'm saying, there's all these different factors that I think about when I decide which way to load my quilt. And for today's purposes, I've determined in order to get my eights up and down, my seam also has to run up and down. So it's not a deal breaker. I just want to let you know that. Some quilters will say, oh, I always load the seams horizontally. I don't really always anything. But for today, the seam is running vertically. I sewed it myself, so I'm fairly confident that it's not too puckery that I'll be able to get a smooth result. Let's get started. So I'm loading with my trusty red snappers. That basically means that in my leader, right here, there's a red hard uh, tube in there, and then I'm just snapping on 
the channel over top that anchors the whole thing in place. My favorite loading method ever because it's so fast. However, if you don't have red snappers, you can do a similar loading method to mine with pins. So I could be pinning this whole edge here. The real marvel that I'm going to show you in terms of time saving is the fact that I do not need to measure and center my backing. You can see I didn't do that. I simply laid it approximately where I want to quilt. And by the way, I'm just going to check in with Mr. Producer. Am I okay here for space, Dave, or do I need to move to the right some more? I think we'll be okay because the quilt is not as wide as the backing. With the backing, I'm going to run off screen a little bit, and I apologize for that. Anyway, I'm loading the front edge of this quilt. I've just laid it smoothly across my roller, not really lining up anything centered necessarily. And you'll see how that works in just a moment. So the front edge is all attached. Fairly important that this edge of your backing be nice and straight. Doesn't matter so much about that other edge. So I've got my front straight edge attached. I've tossed my backing over my rail to the other side and now I'm going to go around my machine and smooth that all out. I'm looking for a couple of things. In this case, I want to be sure as I roll that I keep this seam from pulling up tighter. I certainly want to be sure that my backing is not veering to the left or the right. So if I were to pull this like this, can you see I immediately start getting these angled kind of ripples? That's how I know it's not straight. So I'm going to adjust it and smooth it until I'm sure that it is straight over this rail and hanging down the back or the front of my machine, however you, whatever you call that, the other side. And then it is simply a matter of rolling it up onto the frame. And if I have smoothed that well, it will roll up perfectly straight. So you can't see on camera, but I can when I'm rolling. So I'll just tell you about it a bit. Underneath here, I'm able to see the edge of my backing, which in this case is actually a selvage. So I know it's straight. So that's another kind of double check for me. I can see that that is rolling up straight onto the roller. So just another confirmation, this is working. And sometimes if it doesn't roll perfectly smoothly, I'll walk around and smooth it out again. Bigger quilts, sometimes you have to do that a time or two or three. And I just roll it on until I see that it's getting near the end of my leader. And now I'll walk back around and put my red snappers on this side. So here's where if this edge were not perfectly straight, it doesn't really matter. I would just let it, wow, that's not a very good camera angle, is it? There we go. I would just let it extend off the edge and trust that my rolling has put it on here smoothly and now I'm just gonna clip it in place right where it is. And the way I use these red snappers, is this showing well on camera, Dave? I can't see both what I'm doing in the camera. I take my left hand and I go about a foot or so ahead of where it's attached, put it on firmly and basically anchor it with my left hand. And then I go back with my right and fit that all down smoothly. If I just keep push, 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 pushing, my fabric will veer out of place. So experiment with them for yourself. But the important thing is that this does not shift up and down. You need to control that in some way. And this is how I have found it works well. So pulling that snapper along, holding it with my left hand, and then pinching it in place. Okay, now I'll go and roll it up and just that quickly we have our backing loaded. And can you see that is straight, smooth, flat, 100% happy. I'm going to grab the batting and Dave's going to load up a couple of your questions.
and we'll talk about them before we go on. Comments or questions, whichever. I'm happy to have both. Right, Anne's checking in from Cincinnati. I did say hello to you already, Anne, but welcome again. Debbie from Chicago, great. Karen, um, hi Susan, I'm from South Africa and thrilled I found you. I'm trying to find red snappers here, love the quick way. It is great. Um, pinning also works the same method of attaching at the front, tossing it over the other side and then rolling it on also works when you're pinning. I have used that method too, long before I had my red snappers. Judy, hi from Georgia. Karen, love the idea of not centering and floating. This is making me happy to begin to long arm. It's an enormous time saver. There are reasons for specialty quilts or show quilts why you might want to center and measure and do all that stuff. But what you're seeing is my kind of day-to-day -day process and how I do most of my quilts. So be aware this is not the way to load a quilt. It's a way. Let's take a few questions if there are some. Yep. Look, Dave is very clever. He made a Q&A screen for us. Monica, did you catch just the edge of the fabric in the red snappers? Yes, but generously catch it. Like make sure it's all the way under that hump, not just a little bit of it caught in there, right? Because you don't want it pulling loose as you're quilting for sure. Debbie, when I use the red snapper side clamps, I get a lot of fraying. How do I handle this? Um, are they pulling right off that it would be fraying? Because if so, you're probably pulling them too tight. They shouldn't be letting go and pulling threads, I don't think. While I talk though, while Dave loads those, I'm going to keep working on my batting. Sue, how much extra fabric do you need for the red snappers versus pinning? Not very much. Um, they only take about an inch to actually attach. You need a little more because you can't quilt right up to them. So what I tell my clients generally is that I want four inches on all the edges of my quilts and I find that to be perfectly satisfactory. And I think even pinners will say they want four inches. So in terms of how it relates to my clients or fabric requirements, I don't think it's that much different. Debbie, my first live, hello from Tallahassee. Well, welcome, I'm so glad you're here. Tallahassee is in Florida, Dave. We're having a little geography lesson here. Okay, so the batting I'm putting on here is Hobbs 8020. It is my favorite all-purpose batting. So the 80% is cotton, the 20% is polyester. It's a little bit, if you've used 100% cotton a lot, what's different about this, it's just a wee bit fluffier, which I kind of like, that's not a bad thing. One of the features that the polyester gives it is it does not crease as badly when you fold your finished quilt. You know how when you get them out, sometimes it'll have those crease memories. I find the Hobbs is a little more relaxed about that, so I love it. Um, it's super easy to work with. It's very washable and durable, and the price is right. It's very economical, so it's my favorite all-purpose batting. Off to get the quilt. Okay, here's the fun quilt. This is my own design, by the way. This I call houndstooth plaid. You can see why. There we go, get the right angle. It's this kind of two-color houndstooth going on. Um, this was featured in McCall's Quilting Magazine in I think May, June of this year. Don't know that you can still find that on the store shelves, but um, it was featured in a kind of green and blue and haze was the color, a really pale gray um, color combination. So this was my very first prototype before I sent it off to the magazine. And um, if anyone happens to be interested, I know you're all quilters. You probably make your own quilts. But if you know people who want quilts, this one is going to be up for sale because I have several renditions of this quilt. And how many do I need, really? Okay, so I have made sure, remember, that my eights are going to run up and down as I quilt. My mustaches and top hats on the backing ran this way, so I also want my hound's tooths to be running up and down. I, there's not a really wrong way I suppose to do them, but I prefer this angled look to the other way, if that makes sense. So that's just what I've chosen. And one last topic is thread choice. 
I've chosen a kind of mid-level thread because as you can see, I've got this um, kind of linen colored background here. This is kind of a cork with different shades of browns and golds in it. And then the sort of cinnamony, I don't know where I can point it that you can see it on camera. You'll see as we do closer shots of it, what the three colors are. So there's quite a wide variation in there, right? Between the cinnamony color and the linen particularly. So what I've chosen is a thread that's about halfway in between. And I mean, I didn't have one that was perfect. So it's a little more towards cinnamon than towards linen, but it was my favorite choice of the different threads I tried out. I looked at doing a linen color. I looked at doing a cinnamon color. But what happens with that, if I do cinnamon, then it almost disappears in this area and it's quite high contrast in this area. So that's my personal thread philosophy is to pick something between and then it will show up similarly on both fabrics. So that's what I have done. Now what I'm doing here is called floating a quilt top. I have not rolled the top onto a roller on my quilting machine and I'm not going to roll it onto a top. I've just got it laying on top of my layers and I'm going to baste it in place in the area that I'm going to be stitching quilting and the rest of it is just going to float down the front of the machine toward me. And Lucy is unthreaded, so bear with me while I get my needle threaded. There we go. Okay. Getting everything square and smooth. Now, uh, what's the best camera angle here? One other thing I'm going to add in. Um, a lot of times I show you guys that I take, I take shortcuts, quite honestly, in my quilting. I've done a bajillion quilts. And so, for example, I don't always pin my edges before I start basting them. I just start basting and make adjustments as I go. And I've done enough quilts that I can get that pretty accurately. But in this case, the edges of these striped pieces are all bias. So I am going to take a minute to pin those every so often in place. And I may still adjust them as I'm stitching to make sure that this line is perfectly vertical. But that keeps it by and large without shifting or at least limited shifting. I can see, you know, every eight inches or so I can see where I'm heading and I won't um, inadvertently build up a big old pleat. I'm just wondering if I should do one additional step here. I think I will, you guys. I'll show you this because this might be of help to you. Again, because I will be working with bias along the top edge of the quilt and I want to pin it, I need to have a straight line to pin it to. Again, my usual method is to just um, wing it and make slight adjustments up and down as I'm quilting. But in this case, I want to pin it so then it makes it harder to wing and adjust. Make sense? So what I'm going to do is just run a stitching line through just the batting and the backing. Now my machine has something called a channel lock. So that's what I've turned on that makes, locks my machine so it can't move backwards and forwards. I'm trying to get in the camera, there we go. So that I've got a perfectly straight horizontal line. If your machine does not have a built-in channel lock, experiment a little bit with like office clips or things like that that you can clamp onto your rail where your wheels are on your machine that hold it horizontal. Because this horizontal line can be really helpful when you're to have something to line up to. And if you don't have a basting stitch, just stitch your regular way across the top of this. Doesn't really matter. This won't be part of the quilt. It's just a visual guideline. There we go. So now I've got that lovely straight line that I can line up the top of my quilt with. And then I can put a few pins in it to be sure that it's going to stay nice and straight and not stretch out on me. I'm 
I'm pulling my side pins out because I got that basting line a little bit lower. So I'm going to pull my quilt down just a little so I can see it. I'll even go a little further down so you guys can see what I'm doing. So I'm not necessarily right against that stitched line. I'm about a half or three quarters of an inch away, but it still is a very definite visual guide, right, to keeping the top of that quilt straight. And I'll start about in the middle. Just loosely put in a few pins, and then I'll come back and put in a few more. So if you're not comfortable winging it as much as I do, you could certainly put in more pins. Not a problem. But this for me just gives me this check and balance, you know, every eight or ten inches. So I can never go too far wrong before I'm seeing another pin and making some adjustments. So all of these little things are things you can decide on your quilt. You know, how perfectly square do you want it? How much time do you want to invest in this quilt? If it's a little 40 inch square baby quilt, it might not be worth taking all this time. If it's a larger quilt, you might need to in order to be sure that it stays reasonably the same from top to, you know, 90 inches later at the bottom. I'm just going to show you some choices and then you can use the ones that seem appropriate for the quilt you're working on. Okay, so now we're going to baste this edge. And I say baste loosely because I actually use my same stitching stitch length, which is 13. Uh, just a sec, I need to confer with Dave here. Dave, I need about an inch more in the camera. Like I need to stitch right there and it's pulling the machine. This is one of the beauties of live quilting, by the way, people. <laughs> we don't always know precisely where it's going to be loaded, although I try and have guidelines for myself before we begin. So Dave, bless his heart, is actually shifting his whole production table to give me just a little bit more room. That's perfect. I did tell you, it's a reality show. So once again, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I do have channel locks. So now I've got the vertical one on, so I know that my vertical line will be straight. So there's a couple things I do to take up any excess. Because I've got this bias edge right here, right? If I were to just stitch, it would push this out in front of me. Can you see that? And I would right away be getting pleats and puckers in there. So. My pins help in me knowing where that should be, and more pins would help too, but here's another way. I grasp the edge of my fabric that is already stitched down and put a little bit of tension on that as I'm stitching. And that just pulls it under the needle as opposed to letting it sort of run away behind. Can you see how that's helping? And just do it slow enough that you can make adjustments as you go. See, there's a little bit of fabric pushing up behind, and I'm just going to put pressure on and keep it pulled in. And I'm kind of squaring off my corner. Can you see that? That's going to get trimmed a little bit away there. I'm okay with that. And now I've got the horizontal channel lock on, and we're going to run across the top. Same principle applies. All these striped blocks have a bias edge, so most of the top of this quilt. So I'm going to either pull on this little fabric that's already stitched here, or sometimes it's enough to just put tension on the stitched area of the quilt. So my left hand is literally putting some weight on there, and that's just pulling it a little bit faster under the needle than it would go on its own. I'm watching to be sure that my seams are staying stitched shut. And if they seem like they're coming open, I'll often just backstitch a little bit over them to reinforce. These are just some of the things that I do when I'm stitching down the top. Now, can you see this is wanting to run ahead of me here? So I'm not going to let that get away from me. I'm going to right away start putting a little more tension 
on that upper fabric, pulling that little bit of rippling in. You can deal with quite a lot of that if you catch it early. And don't let it get away from you and form a big old pleat. Just go as slow as you need to to hang on to things. And as we baste, you're getting a good look at the different colors of fabric that are in the quilt, the cinnamony one that I'm on right now. And then the linen color. And then the cork. So again, I'm just pulling on the bit that's already stitched. Put a little bit of tension on it. And you may notice that I stitched over my pins. Knock on wood, I have never broken a pin or a needle doing that. Um, but I only do it when I'm going very slowly, and that must be the key. But I'll leave that up to you to decide whether or not you do that. Some quilters say never, never, never. But I seldom say never. If it works, do it. Okay. Our quilt is basted. I'm going to come back over here. I think I want the close-up camera for just a sec, Dave, to show something here. Um, I can't because I can't because it's a puckered area that I want to show. Can you guys see that? There we go. Okay. See right here. I was. I was really tugging on that to get some excess in to make this corner as square as I could. So you can kind of see there's a bit of ripples and fullness there. I just wanted to point that out before we start quilting because that's going to disappear into the quilting and be totally taken up. The key is to get it as evenly distributed as you can so as not to get a pleat in one place. And you can get away with an awful lot by doing that. Okay, we have a few questions on basting. Okay, one moment. I'm just stepping out of camera to get a tissue. All right. Okay, we have some questions on basting. Let's go. Let me get another swallow or two of coffee and while we talk. Monica, do you put side clamps on only after you base? Yes based. That didn't come out right. Yes, because if I put them on first, my backing would be more taut, I feel like, than my quilt top that's laying on top. So I've, I usually give the backing a tug to make sure that it's, has no wrinkles in the back, but I do wait to actually apply that tension until after it is basted. Yes. Sue, I struggle with basting. I end up using a straight edge ruler. You know what? If that works, do it. I have done that too with quilts that are giving me trouble. Or if you don't have a channel lock, maybe that's an option is to use a straight ruler. You might want to pin a little oftener then because you won't have enough hands to man the ruler and ease the fabric. Pat, I have a domestic machine, but I find I learned so much even from long armors. Thanks. Good, good. S lots of these designs that I do should be useful for you on a domestic machine. Some of them I developed when I was quilting on a domestic. And Lori tuning in from Yakima. Awesome. That's like my next door neighbor. All right, little sip of coffee and side clamps. So these are also part of the red snapper system. I'm not, you know, a salesperson necessarily for their brand, but what I like about these clamps is how long they are. So I have a 26 inch throat, as I mentioned earlier, and I like to have that clamping tension covering as much of my quilting area as I can. What came with my machine is just a clamp here and a clamp here, and not surprisingly, you're apt to get little scallops in the edge of your quilt if you do that. So I do like the long clamps. So any brand you can find that has a long gripping area is a win. And you just want gentle tension on it. Um, just enough to keep things smooth and taut. You don't want to be stretching it out of shape. And both with the side clamp and with my rollers this way, my general rule of thumb is 
if I put my fingers underneath the quilt, are you able to see them? Sort of, kind of. I should actually be able to grab my fingertips. It should not be so tight that I can't grab my fingers. So it might look smooth and tightly stretched. And there is some tension on it, but it's not like a drum. So that's my, that's my kind of rule of thumb. Should be able to grab your fingers under there. So let's get the other clamp on and we are ready to quilt. Actually, we're not quite ready. We have to mark our rows yet. This Crazy Eights design um, is row based and I like to keep them straight and even. Now, obviously this quilt top has very definite vertical rows in it, or sorry, horizontal rows in it. However, I want to know how deep to make them. So this is my trusty tool, painter's tape. And you can use the same piece over and over again for the duration of the entire quilt. And I use it thusly. These measurements, I'm going to give you what I'm doing today for measurements. They're a little bit flexible in terms of how much or little quilting you want on your quilt top. But I'm measuring about four inches down from the top of my quilt, running my tape all the way across as straight as I can manage it. And you want to keep your tape long enough that it sticks to your batting on the edges or else the ends pop up and roll in if you're only on the fabric. So that's just one little wee tip. Okay, and here comes the quilting design. I start in about the middle from top to bottom of the eight and just start quilting eights. Now, I'm going to make them approximately two inches apart on the top. I'm not marking them, but in the early days of doing this design, I used to. I would take a, like a water or air erasable marker and even on my batting, I would put a little divot every, I mean, depending on my spacing. Today I'm going two inches, sometimes I do one and a half, but I would put a little mark on that batting to give myself, again, that visual guide. And if you're just beginning this design, pretty sure you're gonna want that. It's pretty hard to eyeball it. But I've done this design, oh, a few hundred times. And we're just gonna start quilting eights. You see what I mean by a repetitive design? I was talking briefly about marking where your eights would be for spacing. And I should mention too, you only need to do that for the very first row because that establishes your spacing. And now in subsequent rows, you're just going to be slotting them in between. So you only have to do that one time. 
So I'm going to go back across the top and put in the ends of Crazy 8s as though my design seamlessly travels right off the edge. And if you don't know what to quilt there, sometimes I have actually quilted the whole quilt first and then come back and done this when I have a better sense of what size they should be and what they're looking like nested between each other. That's totally fine. But I find if I don't do this, then the top and bottom edge look a little unfinished. So I'm just imagining that these are cut off in a straight line and I'm just putting in what would appear if the design were continuing right off the quilt. And there we have it. So now I'm going to do the thing I forgot earlier, which is to put my magnetic clamps on the front of the machine. This is another fairly critical part of floating a top. This edge is not attached to anything. There's no tension on it, right? We've got tension at the top, tension on the sides. We need something to hold this fixed. And my solution is these magnetic bars. And I think Dave will probably put a link on screen. For sure, we'll put it in the YouTube description. Um, local hardware stores will often have them, but for sure Amazon does if you can't find them locally. They're just simple magnetic bars, assuming that your machine has magnetic or metal rails. That puts that little bit of tension on the front so that it cannot pull up as you're quilting. Quilting will always want to pull together, so you need to be proactive in controlling that. That said, the next thing to do is just to measure down from the bottom of my last row of eights. I do about three inches. Again, this is customizable to whatever quilt you're working on. You could do this on a tiny scale. I don't know that you could do it a whole lot bigger and control it, but you know, be my guest and try it. So once again, I just lay my tape. It extends over onto my batting on both edges. That keeps it from lifting and rolling. I travel down my basting line to what I think is about the middle, top to bottom of my eights, and I'm going to continue across again. So Dave's got me on a bigger picture. There will be less of the close-up camera today because, let me get on screen, this design quilts easier a little bit faster, in my opinion. Um, you'll, you'll probably hear in the machine noise, it'll get smoother when I'm going a little faster, and it's just somehow a bit easier to control. So. I don't want you to get sort of seasick from all the vibration. So for the most part, we're going to show the quilting, you know, on the bigger screen and you can just see the process taking place. Um, there's nothing really new about the design. It's just eights all the way through.
All right. So now I'm issuing a challenge to myself. I have quilted this design before on my live and unscripted episodes, and I've done I don't know how many quilts using it. And I have always um, broken thread at the end on the right hand side and come back and started again on the left. So much like handwriting, done it in rows. However, I was listening to myself the other day. Uh, can I get on camera fairly well? Not really. <laughs> there we are. I was listening to myself telling some of my um, freehand quilting students that you've got to be able to quilt equally, comfortably in every direction, up, down, left, right, right, left, all those things. And I thought, huh, personal challenge. Why don't I quilt my crazy eights um, equally well in both directions? So I did a quilt this weekend, this past weekend with this design on it. And I did quilt left to right and right to left. So that means we don't need to break thread. Fingers crossed it goes okay, you guys. Here we go. And my thread just broke. And it is reality TV, so you'll get to see me fix that. I don't know why. Um, I suspect part of it is I'm going pretty fast, and maybe Lucy's not loving that this morning. So I may try and pull that back just a little bit. My kind of rule of thumb is if the thread breaks once, fix it and keep doing what you were doing. If the thread breaks again, something is amiss. So whether it's, you know, deciding I need to slow down or re-threading from scratch or new needle, do you know what I'm saying? Twice is kind of a habit and then needs addressing. So what I'm going to do is pull up the bobbin thread, which is not broken and cut that off and then I'm going to back up just a couple of stitches and I'm in this um, cork kind of print where I can camouflage a uh, splice of thread. So that's where I'm going to start stitching again and I'm going to try to just continue on. So I'm overlapping my previous stitching by probably two or three stitches and putting in a few lock stitches to hold that splice in place and they're not on top of each other but almost and I'll leave the tails for the moment and cut them later if I were to cut them right away it would probably come undone when I start stitching with a jerk so I'll leave them for the moment and come back and trim them afterwards I think we managed that okay. And it broke again. So now that's my clue. Something is not right. So to begin with, I'm going to rethread this last area that's close to me because often when it does break with a jerk, 
that will have pulled it, you know, incorrectly in my, um, what's this called? The intermittent thread guide? Intermittent, hmm, whatever that little spring is. You guys know what I mean, yes? The little spring that bobs back and forth with your thread and keeps it flowing smoothly. So I've re-threaded that area in case that's where the problem is. And this is how I deal with thread breaks. I just try one thing after another until it's fixed. And fingers crossed that when I'm doing a live broadcast, that's sooner rather than later. And this time, I feel like it would really show to splice in this linen fabric. So I can do one of two things. I can do a true splice, which would be um, knotting my thread. I don't want to go into all the detail to show it today. I've shown it in other episodes, but basically where there's no lock stitching showing. So I would, I would undo a piece and then knot and pull inside my pair of threads from the previous stitching. And then I would do the same thing beginning. I would just try and start stitching and then knot those threads and pull them inside so that I had a seamless looking splice. That's really hard to do in the middle of a row of stitching. So I'm not going to attempt that, but that would be an option. Maybe if you were working in an area that wasn't quite as visible as this. I'm instead just going to go back to an area where I think it won't show. And that is just personal preference. There's more than one way for sure to splice. And I'm just putting strong tension on my top thread. I've got it wrapped around my fingers and I'm pulling on that almost to the breaking point to pull up the bottom thread and then I can reasonably quickly pull up those stitches with my seam ripper. You can do the same thing by pulling, pulling hard and creating that tension and literally snipping every few stitches with your seam ripper. I've tried that too. Um, I find it takes longer to pull out all those little cut bits, but you might give it a try. It might work for you. I don't know if you can hear that little pop when I'm pulling up each stitch. That is an indicator to me that my tension is just right. Those threads are literally twisted and almost locked between each and every stitch, which makes undoing a royal pain, but helps me to know that my tension result on the quilt is good. Okay, so I'm back to my little cork area. I'm just going to trim those threads off really close to the quilt and do my same little overlap of a few stitches plus some lock stitches to hold that in place. So I'm pulling up my bobbin thread here. I know you probably can't see because of the cork. So I've just taken one stitch that pulls up a loop of bobbin thread and I'm pulling that to the top so I can hang on to both of them. And we're up and away, fingers crossed. Trim my last thread tails. Boy, we didn't make very many inches of headway, did we? Look at me now, stitching all cautiously. I'm afraid of the thread breaking. So there we are, finished that row. So let's recap for a second in case you're wanting to try this design in terms of the measurements that I used. So to begin with, are we on this camera here? Okay. To begin with, I measured four inches down from the top basting edge of my quilt here. And that's how long I made the first row of figure eights. Now again, this is customizable for you, but this will give you an idea of scale, okay? And now every row that I'm adding, I'm dropping about three inches and putting my tape at that spacing. So I'm looking at the bottom of what I just stitched, adding three and putting my tape there. 
So my, my one loop is going to extend above that. So my figure eights are still about four inches long. And I told you I was putting them two inches apart. Nah, I'm just measuring a few for you. Some of them are two, some of them are one and three quarters. So that's about how far the loops are, you know, from center to center of the loop. So that gives you a bit of an idea for scale. I actually like them a little bit smaller. Um, it just, it takes longer. There's more rows in the quilt and I didn't want today's quilting to sort of last forever. Sure, let's take a few questions. I will get me a sip or two of coffee and I will get back on camera. Oop. There we go. How's it looking so far? Are you guys liking this design? I can't wait to show you the finished quilt because the texture, the texture is really super from these eights when it's all done, when you see it as a whole. When you look too closely at each individual eight, you can get a little discouraged, but don't. It looks great as an all texture. Okay, Karen, do you have your stitch regulator on? Yes, I do. In other episodes, I've talked more about when I choose to use it and when not, because I'm often a not stitch regulator when I'm doing an edge to edge design. But in this case, I'm going pretty fast. If I wanted to go that fast without the stitch regulator, it would be at such a high speed. And then if something happens, it would be disastrous. Yeah. So short answer, yes, I have my stitch regulator on. Pat, love that pattern. I'm working on T-Rex Roar quilt and this would be perfect. I haven't met a quilt, Pat, that I didn't love this texture on yet. Sue, just an FYI, the magnets may not work for all brands of machines. Example, APQS. The backing rolls onto that belly bar. It ends up being too thick for the magnets to hold. Good point. Good point. So I've only really ever quilted on a gamel. Both my machines have been gamels, and so I always talk with that frame of reference. So I'm, I'm happy that you chimed in for those who may be watching that have an APQS. Penny, how do you store your magnets? I hear they're very hard to get apart if they stick onto each other and can injure your fingers if your fingers get between them. You betcha. They've got a lot of clout to them. Um, for me personally, you of course can't see it, but I've got a fatigue mat that's right up against the wall behind me here. And there's quite a, a groove at the back of it. So my magnets all lay in a row end to end right up against the wall there. Not only can they hurt your finger if you snap them, but if you stub your toe on one of them, it's not pretty. Laurie, Penny, I stick mine to the sides of my light bar, which is also metal. Great. I can verify they're almost impossible to get apart when they're stuck together. If you slide them first, that sometimes helps, by the way. Amanda, add cabinet knobs to them, Penny. Yes, I have known people to put cabinet knobs. Here, I've got my coffee in my hand and I haven't even gotten a sip. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this on camera or not, but there actually is pre-drilled holes in the ones that I have. So it's easy to put cabinet knobs on there. For myself, I found that they would not stay tight. And so they kept working themselves loose and I found that to be a nuisance. So I've just kind of trained myself where to keep my fingers that is safe. But by all means, give that a try it works for you. <laughs> Dave's laughing at me. How did you train yourself? Yeah. Well, that's called the school of hard knocks. Yeah, yeah. Stitches in the dark. The thread breaks. Barbara, does Lucy prefer to stitch one direction or another, i.e. more thread breaks, etc., going right to left or left to right? That's a great point, Barbara. Lucy is pretty good about boing, going both ways. I sometimes have to tweak my needle position a little. Um, but it's a really great point because if I find the next time that I'm going right to left that I get those thread breaks, that's going to be my clue, right? Because these two thread breaks were both going in that direction, the direction that is sometimes troublesome. So we'll, we'll remember that and we'll come back to that and revisit it. Amanda, and maybe the right to left at that speed. You guys might be totally right. And that might be a reason to always stitch in the same direction. So we'll try that out. I have my husband separate the magnets. Yes. Go team. Karen, that is a lovely large thread unpicker. Honestly, it is just, it is the Dritz um, variety. They're my favorites. And piece of interest, I change them out fairly often. Um, sharp ones, like I always keep a new one on hand and every so often I try the new one. And if it works way better, I know it's time to toss the old one. Um, a sharp one makes all the difference. S powers. I have a handy quilter and frame. The magnets work for me. Good. 
that will just, you'll have to determine that for yourselves. Obviously, if you have wooden rails, they're not going to work either. Um, yeah. Lori, I had to insert a wedge to get my magnets apart. They are super powerful. They are, which of course is to our advantage when we're trying to hold a quilt. But can be hard on the fingers. I'm sorry? No, I just have one more that I'm not using. Dave was going to do a demo wi for you guys with two magnets, but I don't have two spares. Okay. Uh, Sue, what SPI do you have the stitch regulator set at? I've got it set at 13 per inch right now. I would not go much higher. When I'm going at this speed, um, I would not go any higher than 13, quite honestly, just because then you would have to slow down. Okay, so we're going to quilt another row and let's see how our thread does going right to left. No thread breaks. So I think we're going to have to take as a working hypothesis it's the right to left at that speed that Lucy's not loving. So I have trimmed my thread and we're going to do left to right every time. So good to know. And you know, I'll always keep trying it on quilts because there's a possibility that it's a combination of the thread that I'm using and the fabric that I'm quilting on and the backing and all that stuff right so I might get a slightly different result if I was using different materials and so I would try it on another quilt because it would certainly be faster to not have to go back to the beginning every time. I am going to mention a couple other things because one of today's focuses is on keeping the quilt square so I want to show you one of my other favorite tools and then I'll leave it set up for the rest of the morning of the episode. What I'm pulling across right here, uh, whichever camera is easier, Dave, I think the big one's best. This is my trusty Long Armors measuring tape. This particular brand is Colonial. And I'm just stretching it across the top of my quilt. And I'm clipping it at both ends. Can you guys see this? I just have this type of little office clip, right? So I'm just looping around my end rails and clipping it with this. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what gives me kind of foolproof um, guidelines for keeping my quilt square and straight. So these tapes come with, they've got a zero in the middle and then they go out from there, one, two, three, four, five, etc. So you certainly can use them to center your quilt. I honestly don't. I look at what my right hand measurement is and what my left hand measurement is and I keep that consistent every time I advance the quilt. So we've got 43 on that side and 22 and a half on the left side. So every time I advance the quilt, I'm going to make sure that it measures up to those markings. So this is important 
for a couple of different reasons. If I had a quilt that wasn't particularly square, that would help me create squareness, right? I would predetermine what I wanted that size to be, probably the narrowest area on my quilt, and then all the way down, I would fit it within that size. In the case of this quilt, it has so many bias blocks in it that it would be all too easy to distort one way and another, right? So I'm going to measure those sides right and left every time I advance. Then too, I've carefully made my tape so that it's attached to my rail level on both sides so that this is horizontal. I mean, it's not an exact science because I can move it, but I'm using it as a visual guideline to make sure that my horizontal seams are running straight. My rail is that guideline too, so those are just all kind of visual checks and balances that I use to make sure that I'm not, you know, advancing one side faster than the other. Okay, I've advanced my tape three inches. We've got two more before we do the first advance. Cork is super hard to see on. I'm glad there's not an awful lot of that in big areas. Somebody left the ruler sitting right in the middle of the quilting area. Can't imagine who that was. You can hear that I'm really making an effort to stitch at a really smooth pace. That just helps with the design that's this repetitive to keep it consistent. And it's just good practice. I've often said that my day-to-day -day quilting like this is the best possible practice for when I want to do high-end custom work. And so I'm always kind of conscious of practicing the skills that I need for custom work while doing my edge to edge. And I have decided that I'm going to advance the quilt now because there's barely room to do another row. Actually, maybe what I could do is just advance it about a half an inch. Look at that. And get one more row in. So let's just double check. Perfect. We're good to go. Okay, we can do one more row. So I just measure my tape. As you can see, I'm measuring it on the right side, and then I'm just running it. I'm using the seam line and just eyeballing my tape across the rest. I'm not measuring every increment, if that makes sense. And on the right-hand side, I didn't baste quite all the way to the bottom of that, so I'll just tuck a pin in there so that it can't be pulling out of shape. Put my stretcher back on the right. These stretchers are a little tricky because I do have a selvage edge on the right, and you know how they're kind of fuzzy sometimes? It can be hard to get that stretcher on there, but we did it. Another thing you may have noticed is how high I have my machine. This is the type of quilting that I do the most, this edge-to-edge -edge type of work, and so for me, it helps with visibility so that I don't have to be stooping and kind of looking under my machine. That all has to do with your machine brand and, you know, exactly how it looks in front of you and what the visibility is like. 
I've never seen anyone, I don't think, use a machine up in the rib cage like I do. But for my type of quilting, that works for me. So I always encourage quilters to experiment and try. If, if at all, if it's possible to adjust your machine, try some different heights and see what works for you. This time I will leave the needle in because I will just continue that um, into my basting line after I've advanced the quilt. So if you have any questions, feel free to be typing them in. This will take a couple of minutes to advance. While I do this, if anyone is just joining in, I am Susan Smith in my studio, Stitched by Susan, and I am quilting a freehand edge-to-edge -edge project from start to finish today. A little bit of emphasis on what it means to float a quilt top and how to keep that square and straight throughout your quilt. I see that my batting is kind of bunching up underneath so I'm just going to go ahead and flip my quilt up. This is one of the beauties of floating it is you're able to do that. Just flip it up and make sure that everything is flat and smooth underneath. And again, with this particular quilt, every block that has stripes in it is bias, has bias edges, all four edges. So that is a consideration throughout this quilt, is keeping that managed and under control so that I don't distort the quilt in the quilting process. So I've got my trusty measuring tape laid across on top of it. Anyone remember what my measurements were? Pop quiz. So I'm, I don't have my quilt necessarily centered on the measuring tape, but I know what the measurement is on the right, and I know what it is on the left. And so I'm lining up my quilt between those two measurements pretty carefully. So I've got 43 on the right. and I'm tugging on the fabric just a little on the area that's already been stitched to make sure that I'm pulling it under the needle quickly enough and that it's not pushing out in front of my needle. Getting a little chubbier basting line than I like. I'm just gonna scoot over a dab. It's my own quilt, so I can deal with that when I bind it. I will make sure that basting line does not show or worst case scenario, I'll undo a few stitches of it if I find that it was into the quilt a little too far. I try for my clients to keep that basting line closer to 3 16 than to a quarter inch so that they don't have to fuss with or worry about it showing. And I am certainly struggling with getting my little snappers on these um, selvage edges. 
Wow. Not happening. So we're back to the clamps here. These are the original clamps that came with my machine, which are not my favorite because they just put tension on at two points. But I'm just going to put them on there lightly so they're not really pulling. They're just holding things snug. So that was the right hand side. And I've used my trusty tape measure as well, you know, as my horizontal guide too to make sure that my quilt is uh, advancing straight. You know, the left hand is not getting pulled up while the right hand sags, for example. So in all these ways, it's just really helpful to take a few minutes to double check as you're doing your basting, as you're doing your advancing. If you let it sort of get away from you, it can be really difficult at the end of the quilt to deal with that excess. But if you do it as you go, it is quite amazing how much, um, how forgiving it can be. You know the old saying, it'll quilt out, and surprisingly, you can quilt a lot out, so to speak. And if you're having trouble, as I am a little bit here with an excess of fabric, then it might be worth taking a minute to get that fullness distributed and pinned. Holding it at those points frequently can help to just get that excess pulled in. I need even more pins. A couple of weeks ago, I did an episode called, what was the quilting design? I can't recall, but it had and wavy borders in the title. Um, and I showed some of my favorite ways to deal with heavy excess in the edges, because there are ways to deal with it even more severely than this quilt has. But frequent pins is one of the ways. So as you can see, I'm getting it in. It looks rippled for sure, but there aren't pleats. And those ripples will disappear when I quilt. Promise. Pinky swear. Let's take a couple of comments while I take a sip of my coffee. Comments, comments. I'm smiling at a camera and waiting for Dave to change it. <laughs> this is the beauty of a two-person show. But you know, I, I'm forever grateful I could not do this on my own. And I should give kudos actually to Dave. I don't think I did properly at the beginning for organizing and keeping all the, uh, juggling all the things to put on these shows. So he's behind the scenes manning all the cameras and screens and hubs and so forth. So there's Dave, that's my husband, we're a team. And also I wanna give thanks to Dan Unger whose music you hear throughout these episodes. He's my friend who's a great guitarist and allows us to use his music and it's really lovely. Okay, back to Q and A's and or comments. Amanda, I have mine high too. My back feels better when I don't hunch so much. Absolutely, absolutely. Whatever you can do to make it more comfortable and ergonomically sound is a win. Penny, mine is set high also. There you go, I'm not the only one. I'm just the only one I see on YouTube, I guess, you know, with my machine up so high. I don't know who this is. Hey, yeah, who's this? Dave, extra credit if you can stump Susan with a question. Try, do it. I'll be honest, if I don't know, I'll tell you. Debbie, 47 and 22.5. Oh, you were close. It's 43 and 22.5. Um, Debbie, do you bind the quilt for customers? I do if they request it, absolutely. Um, I do only do machine binding, mind you, but like 100% machine binding. But yeah, I do sometimes. Sue, when you advance, are the new side basting lines in line with the previous ones? Depending on design density, is it normal for those not to line up? I see what you mean because the part that I've rolled up is wanting to pull. Um, so sometimes I fudge that a little bit. Sometimes I literally grab the sides of my quilt, you know, and tug that into shape because I do want them to line up, right? I can't, um, that's why the measuring tape, I guess, is important because if you just eyeball it and you start where the last basting line left off and continue sewing, your quilt is apt to get a little narrower as you go along. So the measuring tape is your foolproof guide for that. Okay. 
one last slurp. Let's see if I can get this side into my red snapper. Maybe. Almost. Nope, I cannot. I'm not going to waste a ton of time doing that. I'll just put my clamps on gently and call it good. All right, so we need to move our painter's tape down to our three inch mark. And you may notice that I did not advance as far as I could have with my 26 inch machine for a couple reasons. One, it's much harder for you to see on camera if I get up behind the roller. And two, I typically don't advance it all the way. That is quilting very much at arm's length. You know, for me to be working out there, it's handy to have that space when I'm working on something that, you know, maybe one giant custom block extends way up there and I love to have that space, but I don't always quilt the full depth. So just do what's comfy. Okay, while I'm at this end, Jenna, you showed once that scalloping the edges is a great way to secure them. Yes, scalloped edges is my most intensive way to ease in um, excess edging. Just literally stitch on, off, on, off that little basted edge. All righty, we are back to quilting. So I'm going to do a few rows now without too much stopping or pausing. Feel free to type in your questions. I will certainly stop at the next advance, but I don't want to make this be so long it's unwieldy. So I'm just going to get some quilting done. So maybe Dave will turn up some music for us. And we'll just head down and get it done. I think we can say pretty positively that the right to left was the culprit with the thread breakages because it has not happened since. So good to know.
So Dave is telling me that he polled you watchers over whether you prefer the bigger view or the smaller, and you like the closer up. So I'm totally fine with that, obviously. You're the viewer. You count. Um, just if it starts to get um, too vibrate ness <laughs> that's my new English word. If you start to get too much vibration, just let us know. And perhaps it's the new camera that's really being helpful in that because in other um, episodes I've had to really keep my speed down just in order to accommodate that vibration. So yay if this is helping. so funny you guys I was just quilting the last like 12 inches thinking I know that bobbin's got to be getting close to done and I'm thinking to myself note to self check bobbin at end of row and change it because it's gonna run out soon and sadly it didn't make it to the end of the row so here we are um, I'm just backing up a few stitches because there's no proper tension on that bobbin thread for the last inch or two so I always undo a little bit back to where the tension looks good again and handily that is in this cinnamon colored fabric so I'm just going to go ahead and do a splice um, for ease I'll do it near to a seam allowance that just makes it less visible I feel like This quilt it's easy to see on, but I usually drop my seam ripper or scissors right where my splice is so that I can find it easily when I come back. Because on a busy quilt, that can sometimes be challenging. I do wind my own bobbins, so the amount of time that I'm out of camera right now is how long it takes me to walk to my freestanding bobbin winder, put a new bobbin on it, and start it winding. And next time I go to change, it'll be ready for me. I choose to wind my own bobbins because then I can use matching thread to what I have on top and I like that. So we're back in business. Um, the ruler that I've been using this morning, by the way, is by a1, so A1, the quilting machine brand, they also make rulers. And it's just a straight nine inch ruler. But what I love about it, you've seen it I'm sure in other episodes if you've been watching along. Um, I love the handle. It's got the kind of slanted handle that I can grasp in any number of ways. So I'm using it today just for the purposes of measuring. But I use it in a lot of my ruler work quilting as well. It's one of my favorite rulers.
I did check my um, bob and tension while I was out of camera there for a moment, but let me quick show you my quick way of doing it um, where I'm working. I just, I have my right hand underneath the quilt and I'm just running my nail firmly along a stitched line. And of course I can see at the top if the thread is too tight because it would be looking straight and you wouldn't be seeing individual stitches. Well, running my nail will show me if it's too tight at the bottom because I would feel the laddering or the eyelashing, not even as severe as eyelashing, but just if it's pulling tight at the bottom, your nail will literally tick, tick, tick over those stitches. So that's a quick and easy way to check that your tension is good below. Here's where I'm starting to deal with some of the um, fullness that was in the edging of the quilt. And so I'm going to take these first two a little more slowly. I've got my left hand on the quilt and I'm just kind of stretching it just a little over the arm of Lucy. That just helps to make that fullness distribute evenly to try to avoid any pleats. There we go. So are you seeing how this thread choice is playing out? As I mentioned earlier, my kind of thread philosophy is to go middle of the road, so neither the lightest nor the darkest that is in a quilt for the purposes of edge to edge quilting, because then I feel like it shows up kind of equally across all the fabrics. So I've got a thread that's a couple shades lighter than the cinnamon fabric. If I had had one a shade or two lighter yet, I probably would have gone that way, but I didn't. And I'm a great believer in using what I have. So this is what I chose. As always, I will post pictures of the finished product so you'll get some close-up looks with that and you can let me know what you think. And I feel like those are short. They are. So Susan oopsed. Just at that end, I've got my tape at two and three quarters, not at three. And believe it or not, I could feel that. So that one figure eight is gonna be short. So be it, he's a little height challenged. And I'll just gradually get longer. And nobody but you will be any the wiser. Don't tell, okay?
some schmuck left that ruler again in the stitching space. Can't believe it. Right. We're at the end of that pass. Good time for questions, folks. And there will be just one more pass after this one, and it will be a short one. So we're seeing the end. Measurements were 43 on the right, 22.5 on the left. Perfect. My seam is running nice and straight along this horizontal bar. And where I need to, I'm swooshing a little bit of excess up into the quilt. Again, much can be eased in if you just do it gradually as you go. And don't try and do it all at once at the last second. So I feel like my right side is a little bit lower, so I'm going to swoosh it up just a bit, put a little extra tug on the left, all of that together to make that seam nice and straight. Okay, we've got some comments going on. There we are. Let me get a sip while we're talking, okay? All right, I'm ready. Susan Webster, is this design one that you go over in the master class? Yes, it is. Oh, Linda, a fab tessellated pattern design. Linda is one of my master class students, by the way. I haven't talked about my class today because I try not to make these shows a sales pitch, but as you see, freehand quilting is what I absolutely love, and I think it is invaluable for learning the skills you need, like in your day-to-day -day quilting, but it translates into high-end skills for custom quilting. So to that end, I have created a master class, which is, it has about 35 or 38 different freehand quilting designs in it that I walk through and demo each one. And then a lot of my philosophy and tips and tools and ways to practice and all that stuff to build this kind of skill. And one thing that I mentioned earlier was, it's just critical to learn how to quilt comfortably in every direction because that's just how it all comes together. Dave says, stay in the camera, don't go to basting. So I'm back. When you say that you do the binding by machine, do you attach it on the long arm or on your domestic? I've seen videos that some do on the long arm. I do both, but when I attach it on the long arm, it is perforce attached to the top of the quilt so usually I do that when the client is going to turn it around to the back and hand stitch it. When I do the binding 100% myself, I prefer to machine sew it to the back, bring it around and top stitch it on the front because that's how I get the neatest finish. And I do quite a few of them, so I've got my machine and space set up for doing that at my domestic. That's how I personally do it, but I have attached lots of bindings on the long arm too. And in fact, I think I have a Pinterest idea pin on how to do that with some photographs and the steps on how to do that. 
Judy, do you ever do pantograph design or computer software with your machine? I have never done a pantograph in my life, so that's the short answer to that one. This is my second Lucy, Lucy 2.0, and it does have a computer, and so I have done some computerized designs. Probably comprises less than 1% of my quilting. Um, that's something I would like to learn because I would like to create some digital designs, so I don't, I need to learn more about it. So does that answer your question? Occasionally. Anyone else, Dave? Oh, do you test your tension before starting your quilt? Um, actually, no, I don't. I often will take time when I'm stitching the basting, that very first thing that I did to check my tension out there because that's not going to show in the final quilting. and It gives me a good opportunity to check it out, right? At this point, I know my machine pretty well, so I can usually see indicators if the tension is wrong and then address it because this morning you won't have seen me doing tension checks. That's true, and it's a good thing to do, but you can often do that as part of the basting process to save time. Penny, what are a few of your most valuable and helpful long-term accessories? Let me catch a tissue for a second. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, one of my accessories is Kleenex. <laughs> um, this ruler is one of my favorites. Dave put a, a link in there already for it, just because I like all the ways that you can hang on to it comfortably, and it's not too big and not too small. This tape measure is another. It's Colonial brand. Uh, it's about 14 feet long because I have a 12 foot machine and it's looped around both ends. Painter's tape, which you see me using today, that's a really great favorite. And um, I use air erasable markers quite a lot. They work well for me because I live in a dry climate. If you live somewhere humid, you know, they might disappear too quickly, but I just get super inexpensive ones and use them freely. And I also use just white school chalk on any quilt that that will show on. That's a favorite marking tool. What else? Something I haven't used this morning is my trusty yard sticks. So if I were quilting close to the edge of my quilt and the straps for my side clamps, um, they can get in the way or even the clamps themselves can get in the way of your machine. And so any kind of long stick will help. Well, I don't have it attached, Dave, so I can't really show it. But when your clamps are on here, you can put a stick sort of under your straps and just hold things up. Yard stick works curtain rod works, super inexpensive. And I guess the side clamps, which I did talk about briefly earlier too. This is the Red Snapper brand. I don't think brand is critical to me. What's critical is that I have as long a clamp as my throat space will allow so that I get nice even tension. That's my favorite on each side of the quilt. That answer all those questions? I think those are my favorite tools. Yep. So I'm gonna start basting, Dave, or are there more and more comments yet? That's it, okay, let's get basting. We have about a pass and a half left in this quilt. So to the person who was asking if I line up my stitching, I pretty much do, and now I've turned on my vertical channel lock so that it stays straight. And I've had to manage it a little bit to get it where I want it to be, but it's working. And I'm pulling that excess in from behind. Pausing a sec to make sure my seam allowance is going the way it ought. This time I'm not even going to waste time trying to get my big red snapper on. I will just use my little clamps Again, just very gentle tension, just enough to keep it snug. If your machine has a basting stitch, you certainly can use the larger stitch for doing these edges. I just don't because it just takes that much more time to you know, change to the basting stitch, back out of the basting stitch, and it doesn't really matter because it's all going inside the binding of the quilt anyways. That's just personal preference. I've talked about color of my thread, but in terms of brand, I'm using Isocord 100% polyester thread. My favorite and what I use most of the time for my type of quilting. 
I'm actually not terribly knowledgeable about fancier and more um, intricate thread choices just because I don't do a lot of fussy quilting, honestly. So we're measuring our three inches. Three is my goal. The last one I got at two and three quarters inadvertently. And then I'm just using the seam line of the quilt to lay it down across the whole top, but I will double check it in case. Oh, that's right, you guys. That very first one was the short one. So I want to measure further over. Good thing I double checked. So I'm moving it down just a little bit. So this time my first loop or two are going to be a little bit on the long side. And that's okay. Alright, this time, notice, I'm putting my ruler out, of, well, of course, I'm not throwing it up there. It's when I get to the bottom that I end up putting it in my stitching space all the time. have some really fairly severe um, puckers there, not exactly pleats, so I'm going to pay attention to that when I come across the end of my next row to make sure that I don't stitch a pleat into it if I can help it. I've got a little piece here where the seam allowance I can see is folding the wrong way, so I'm just, I've got a long yeah, you can't really see it. I've got a long needle in my hand and I'm just poking the needle under, pushing that seam allowance into place, and it stays. The batting kind of holds it in place. You know, not critical, but I feel like that might make a little lump in the quilt if I left it, so just took a second to fix that up. Excuse me. Pause for a second and I'm just going to water. Dave muted me so you didn't have to hear the gulps. Okay, back at it. There are a number of quilters out there that I've seen lately or been watching lately 
that do a lot of their quilting with one hand, guiding the machine with one hand, and they're usually it's their left hand resting on the fabric and their right hand guiding the machine. And there is certainly a place for that. You s usually see that with more detailed type of quilting. Um, but this design is one that I really encourage you to do with both hands at the helm. Especially if you're trying to do it fairly quickly, there's this physical almost, um, almost a jerk. And we've just broken thread. There's this almost jerk when you're going around the, the loop of that figure eight. And I feel like it would be really fatiguing and very hard on your shoulders and arms to try and put all that um, into one shoulder's movements. So I really encourage you to do this as a two-hander whenever possible. So I'm not sure why that thread breakage. Again, I'll use my maxim, which is once can be an anomaly. Um, as you can see, I'm at a fairly thick crossing of seams there, so it's just possible that that's all it was, is the thread shredded, because I am going at high speed, so that does, it just does raise the level of incidence of things going wrong. But I am going to back up to the cork at the bottom. So that this does not show as much. Come on. Can you guys see what I'm doing? There we are. So again, I'm overlapping about three stitches of my previously stitched area, pulling up my bobbin thread and doing a couple really close lock stitches, four or five. Leave my tails for the moment, I'll come back and get them later. And they're off. Nope, we've broken again, okay. Houston, we have a problem. So I will redo some of the threading. See if that fixes the issue. My little intermittent check spring, that's the word I was trying to think of earlier and it just wouldn't come to me. So it looks, on my machine anyway, it looks like a tension dial, but it really is not. It's just got the little spring that controls kind of the flow of your thread into the machine. And this is how I deal with thread breaks and or tension issues is I just try one thing after another. And experience has kind of taught me on my machine what are the more likely things. So I try those troubleshooting methods first and re-threading is certainly a good one. If this doesn't fix it, then I'll, you know, kind of take the next thing, escalate, if you will. So earlier, if you're just joining, earlier I was having thread break problems and we concluded that it was stitching from right to left at pretty high speeds, which honestly is what I'm doing. And so I went back to um, breaking thread at the end of each row and doing each row separately. And that's been working good until now. Try to get this where you can see. Not that it's very exciting what I'm doing right now, but it is reality. And it's good I re-threaded. I don't know if you heard there, there was a little lurch kind of in the thread. That tells me that there was some kind of small gnarl in the bottom. So there is something going on with the thread path. So hopefully that re-threading fixed it. But if it happens again, I'll do it in a more major way. And I may um, take a moment here. I'll just take my bobbin out and re-insert it. Sometimes that helps too. It's just these little things. 
it's a it's a delicate mechanism the forming of the stitches and it doesn't take a lot to make it not be precise and perfect so sometimes just reinserting that bobbin if it's had a jerk you know the thread breaking that can be just enough to put it off its stride just run a little bit of thread in the bobbin seems to be flowing smoothly back in it goes I'm sorry if you can't see all that, so that's why I'm kind of talking through it so you know what I'm doing. Pulling up my bobbin thread, so now I have both that I'm hanging on to, overlapping a few stitches, doing a few lock stitches. Put all my tools out of the way. Okay. Here we go. I left my tails kind of in the way, didn't I? I'm not sure if you saw that. My needle caught in the fabric as I was kind of pulling away from my stitching, which is something I'll check after we're off air. That's something that I can adjust on my machine and I imagine you can too. That kind of impulse of where the needle stops when you take a single stitch. And it looks like mine has gotten jostled a little by all these thread breaks that I've had and perhaps I need to adjust that so that the needle stops just a little bit higher up, if that makes sense. Okay, we've measured our three inches. We're laying down the tape. Okay, someone is asking what my reference point is for measuring the three inches. It's literally the bottom of the last figure eights that I just stitched. So if you'll recall, my very first row of figure eights were four inches tall. So now I'm measuring down three because the whole loop is going above, you know, is interlocking between. So my loops are still about four inches from top to bottom. They're just overlapping a little. So I measure from the bottom of the last loop about three. Uh, and honestly, I don't quilt quite down to the tape because if I bump against it, it actually makes it move. It is strictly a visual guideline, so I'm probably only quilting about to a quarter inch away from it. And that is not an exact science. Like, a little bit of variation is just not going to show at all. But it's just my visual guide. Because imagine if I was trying to do this without that straight edge.
Now here I'm going to slow down and I'm going to sew with one hand because I've got this rumpled stuff going on and I want to stretch that just a little bit. So that it gets eased into place. Success. One more row and then I think we'll be able to advance to the end. Oh, maybe two more in this pass. Yeah, I think two more. Somebody remind me if I leave my ruler sitting in the middle. Tell Dave and he'll pass it on. <laughs> this time I remember, just set it out of the way. If you're giving this design a try, I really, really encourage you to not get too hung up on what the individual eights look like because they're not perfect. I mean, when I sit here and look at any two or three next to any other two or three, the loops are not exactly the same size. Some of them are a little bit misshapen. But the thing is, when you get it all done and you look at it as a texture across the whole quilt, it's amazing how all that is not visible to the eye. You just see the pretty even texture and coverage. So don't look too closely at the details. Get the whole thing done and then take a step back and take a look at it.
Alrighty, on to our last advance. Any burning questions before we do that? Or while I do that, perhaps? Ooh, it's gonna be close. I don't know if I can quite stitch that bottom line. Okay, so Dave is telling me that the upper edge is not going to show at all, and that's true because I've got a fat quilt roll. However, I'm going to go ahead and get my quilt basted into place, and then I'll back up a little bit for the quilting because I'm that close. So fixing my right and left edges, 22.5 on the left, 43 on the right, I will take a few questions right now before I start basting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Karen, because the fabric block edges are on the bias, would it have not been easier for you to have edge stitched your top when you had finished sewing it before you long arm? Yep, sure would have been, but I didn't. So, good life lesson for you. <laughs> Pat, what do you think would be the greatest height and width could be for this pattern. Um, it's pretty flexible. The one that I've loaded today is 65 inches square. The one that was in the magazine was another full block longer, and I don't know what that measurement is, maybe 16. So it was about 65 by 83. And certainly you could go another one wider, and then it would be about 83 square, which is a queen. Does that help? Oh, I'm sorry, Dave's just saying to me, doesn't she mean the quilting pattern? And he's probably right. Do you mean the quilting pattern? Um, I don't think there's any limit, really. I've certainly done larger quilts. I've certainly done baby quilts with this pattern. But you might, for example, if you were doing a baby quilt, you might only measure two and a half inches for each row instead of three, and that would just make a little bit smaller scale. Hope one of those answered your question. S powers. Love learning how you deal with tension issues and thread breaks. Thank you. Thanks for saying that, because that's kind of the point of these episodes, being reality show style, live and unscripted, is that you see these little things that do happen to all of us, and this is how I deal with them. Yeah. Okay. Super. So I'm just going to baste around this bottom edge. And then everything will be fixed and in place. And then I'll back up a little bit before I actually start quilting so that you can see it better. And I can see based on my tape measure that my right side was just a little bit droopy. So I've, I'm pulling just a little bit more excess into this side I've pulled down a little bit on the left, like not hard. I don't want to stretch the quilt, but I've just made sure I haven't sort of left any fabric on the table, so to speak. I've got as much out of it as I can. And here I'm at the furthest edges of what Lucy can do. So I'm going to go forward just a little so I can base that bottom edge. And I did use my, my tape measure as a guide to make sure that it was straight. Um, and now I will put my channel lock on and I'm just raising my um, take up bar a little bit because I'm feeling the snug resistance of that being so full and chubby right now. Okay, I've got my horizontal channel lock on. Again, if you don't have one on your machine, try using some type of clip that you can attach to your rails or set in front of the wheels on your long arm. I mean, every long arm is different, but I've heard from lots of people that they're able to do that and kind of jerry rig getting a straight line of stitching. And I'm just running a few pins along this biased edge, which I did not baste, shame on me. Anyway, I didn't. Um, so that overall I've got my fullness evenly dispersed and I can be um, 
checking every time I come to one of these pins to make sure that I'm on track. Alrighty. So I'm doing the reverse of what I did on the top. I had my left hand, you know, pushing here when I was going across the top, but now I'm stitching in the opposite direction. So I'm just pushing on the side that's already stitched. That just helps to pull this under the needle just a little faster than would happen otherwise. Or I guide it with my fingers, whatever you're comfortable with. Don't put your fingers in there if you're not comfortable doing that. And I'm just going to put, this is bias, so I'm putting just a little tension on that quilt to pull it downwards because I see that I'm running very close to the edge. Yep, just those few threads were enough. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I am stitching over my pins. I've always done it. Um, I just do it slowly. Oh, and I'm really near the edge of the quilt there. I will probably run another basting line up about three threads worth. This is hardly enough to hold it. But let's go ahead and get it in place. We'll do a little tug again. Just a little. My seam allowances go in the direction I want. All right. So because I have used my channel locks, I can be pretty confident that my quilt is now square. I have 90 degree corners because I've had the vertical and horizontal locks on. And I know that my lines are straight on the edges. I've used my pink measuring tape to make sure my quilt is the same width from top to bottom. And the only small difference I think that I have, as you saw as I was basting across the bottom, it was about an eighth inch different on the left side from the right. So what I'm going to do is just run another line of basting stitches just a little above, not even an eighth of an inch. Do you see that? Just because I so barely caught the edge of the quilt with my earlier stitching and I don't feel like that is secure enough. And if you had, you know, stars with points and things like that that you were dealing with, you might have to make some decisions about would you rather keep the points and be a quarter inch out of square or would you rather block the quilt? and you know, manipulate its shape just a hair after it's done. Those are all possible things that you could do. But because I don't have any star points and because it was such a little bit, I went ahead and just laid down another basting line. So now my quilt is square. So let's back it up just a little bit so we can get back to our rows of eights. Okay, we have a question. I can't see it. You've got something else on the screen, hon? Okay, Jean, Jean Marie, Jeannie Marie. Was this My Dear Watson, McCall's Quilting May, June? If so, it is available to download. Good to know. And yes, um, I call it houndstooth plaid, but, oh, sorry, Whoop. I'll get over on this one. I call it houndstooth plaid, but they of course have the right to rename it and they called it My Dear Watson, which is a very charming name. I'm totally a fan of Watson. Um, just eventually the rights for it will revert to me. And when I publish it, I want people to be able to look for it by houndstooth and by plaid because those would be more likely search words than my dear Watson. But yes, that is the same quilt. So maybe clarify for me if you don't mind. Typing into the chat window, when you say it's available for download, you mean the magazine as a whole, that publication, right? I would love to know that. 
if you um, are able, if you even added the link into the chat window, that would be great. And obviously, um, it's not going to benefit me to have magazine sales. However, I'm happy if you guys are able to find the design if you want it. And maybe type into the chat window too. I'm seriously thinking about um, early next year hosting a sew along for it. Um, in the magazine, you'll see that they provided a brief review of my method of piecing these striped components and it's different from their method. I think mine is way faster, but I got their point. It's a little hard to explain. So I thought it might be fun to have a sew along and work through that process. In short, these um, striped blocks, I'm not sure where the camera is pointing now or what you can see. These striped blocks, no matter what the color combination was, I just pieced with the fabric strips, all four pieces, and then cut them. So you just sewed four long seams and out of that you got nine of these blocks with very few cuts and very little intricate piecing. Worked like a hot diggity. So let me know if you're interested in that is where I was going with it. If there is interest, I will seriously consider hosting a sew along for that. When I do see that I'm about to sew over a thicker seam area, I've just been slowing down a little because I wonder if that wasn't the cause of the thread breaks. It's just going over seams at this speed. Dave, would you mind handing me my tape measure that's right behind you? What I'm going to do here, um, you guys can see me reasonably well. It doesn't have to be a close-up. All I'm going to do is with my tape measure, I'm going to measure... Uh, they can't see me at all now, hon. The other one was better. just to show you that I'm going to measure the total distance that I have left to quilt and see about how many rows I think I can fit in that. And conveniently for you guys, because I'm working in increments of three, I have like 15 and a quarter inches left. So that's pretty perfect. I'm just going to make each row a smidge longer so that I'm pretty much ending with the bottom of a row of stitching at the bottom of the quilt. And as I did at the top, I will still go back and put in my partial loops don't get too hung up on this because it's fairly easy to fudge a little bit and fill in that bottom row. But I'm just showing you because it's something that might be helpful to you with other designs too. If it was quite a bit different, then I would either lengthen each by maybe a quarter inch or shorten each by maybe a quarter inch, depending on which direction I wanted to go. And if you do that a few times, it will look much less 
severe and different than if you just do one that is vastly different. With this particular design, as I said, it's pretty easy to fudge it. But if you had something with, you know, say fans that were all the same size and it was going to end up awkwardly spaced at the bottom, that's how I would deal with it. I would just spread it out over several rows as opposed to having one very different row. Thread break. It does make a tangled mess when I'm going at that speed, I'll tell you. Right off the hook, I'm going to back up to before my little intermittent spring. I feel like that's breaking with such a jerk that it can't help but be messing with how the thread is fed into that spring. So I will just redo it right from the outset. So I'm not really sure, this is more thread breaks than I typically have in a quilt. I will often do a whole quilt without any. So you know what all the reasons are behind it, I don't know. I think probably top of the list is the speed at which I'm stitching. And I choose to take that risk because I think overall I still get done faster. Possibly if I slowed it down 20%, I would eliminate all those thread breaks. I'm not sure. I'm going to undo just a few stitches because I feel like there's probably unevenness under there. And it did happen at a seam again. So I will try. That, I that is my happy speed that you're hearing. I will try and slow it down a little because it only makes sense, doesn't it? Whether I can change my habit on the fly, I'm not sure. It does seem to be happening where there are seams. So it's just combination of seam and speed is just fraying the thread and causing it to break, I think. We're at a bobbin thread. We're just doomed to be stopping and starting. At least we know what caused that one, right? So Judy is asking apparently whether it's possible that it could be bad thread or a bad spool. You know, it, it certainly is possible, but in hundreds of quilts, I think I've only actually had that happen once where I literally could not figure it out and I changed spools and it was fixed like magic. So I 
It is possible, certainly that. I think it's more likely that it's just the speed at which I'm going. But it's worth considering. That is in my little black book of tricks, things to look for, for sure. Someone is asking if I showed the measuring tape at the beginning of the session, and yes, I did. Maybe if you want to clarify, are you wanting to see the tape to see what it looks like or have another run through of how I set it up? Okay, and apparently it's how I set it up. So yes, remind me if I don't get to it. When I get to the end of the quilt, I'll take a moment to touch on the tape measure again because that's kind of an integral part of today's highlights. Now I'm like someone who's been bucked off a horse. I'm so cautious. <laughs> it won't last. I'll be quilting like a crazy woman by this afternoon again. I know it. Start the countdown. We just have four strips left, four rows. Again, I'm making each of them just a couple threads longer. It's really no biggie. It's such a tiny difference. I could put it all in the last row, but at least I'm being conscious not to make them shorter. Trimming all those tails from that last pass, my word. Honestly, I find, though, that for what I call useful quilts, like this one is, you know, not a show quilt, not trying to impress any judges, that splicing method of just overlapping a couple stitches and then using a few lock stitches and trying to do it in an unobtrusive place, like I challenge anyone to find these just in the ordinary use of the quilt. It's not happening. It's a very serviceable way of splicing your thread without taking an inordinate amount of time.
So I'm going to throw something out here that Dave doesn't know I'm doing. Um, in episodes like today where I'm touching on a number of topics that are kind of important, whether it's side clamps or whether it's thread choices or whether it's the sizes of my design or how to use the pink measuring tape, ideally in my show notes, I would love to put a timestamp when those things occur so that if someone's looking for how do you use that pink measuring tape, they could find where I'm talking about it without spending the two hours. All that to say is very time consuming to find, like I literally have to go back and listen and make notes of that. So here's my offer. If any of you want to do that, let me know because then I don't have half a dozen of you doing it for one episode, but I would be happy to trade private lessons for people that watch an episode and give me the timestamps for the different topics. So if you want an hour of private lesson or so, reach out to me on some of these episodes. I've done it on a few of them and you'll see it in the show notes. Many more that I have not done it for just because it's so time consuming. But I'd love to collaborate. Am I managing to go 20% slower? I am finding that it's messing with my rhythm a little bit. But so far, no more thread breaks, so that's a good sign. There's a bulky seam. T minus three. Oh, I take that back, ladies. There's only two more. What am I thinking? Six inches. We're just about there. And I will post some photos of the quilt as a whole and um, of some close-ups. I generally try to do them the next day. The best time to photograph in my studio is morning. And so it'll probably be tomorrow morning before I get to taking them.
Oh, there's my needle catching again. Something I will need to fine tune. Okay, we're done with the blue tape. Let's see if I can make a basket over there to the trash can. Nope, nope but I just about managed to catch Dave. So clearly I didn't manage to get my rows very much bigger because I'm left with still three and a quarter at the bottom. But you know, I tried. So I'll keep my loops a little bit above the bottom. That way for sure they won't get cut off in the binding because I think that will look nice. And then I'll work my way back doing the sort of half loops to fill in all those gaps. And that'll be it. So yeah, if you have any questions about this process, bring them on and I will spend a minute more talking about the pink tape before we go to. And if any of you want to take me up on the timestamp um, collaboration, just reach out to me via email, info at stitchedbysusan.com and pick an episode. And that way, as I said, I won't have multiple people um, repeating each other. And I will give you credit for it, and I will appreciate it immensely. I'm forgetting to slow down. I'm falling back into my old typical rhythm. This is, of course, optional. I think it looks a little more polished and finished with these loops added in. camera view are we on there I think that's a good place to show it let me show you a tip for doing this if if it's difficult for you to eyeball what to be quilting see how on this design right above I'm right behind Dave's little in picture can you take that one out for a second there you go so at the bottom edge of the quilt here see how I've got a little less than half an inch under those loops so if I put my ruler or any straight edge about under a half an inch above the last row of loops here 
then that gives me a good visual for what to quilt above that. Does that make sense? So I'm kind of recreating this line against another row. And that tells me about where to place my loops in the crossover portion. This is a really simple design, but sometimes you have a more complex one and it's hard to visualize what portion of it to be repeating and quilting. And that's a good way to do it. And something that's less see-through than a ruler is even better because you really see that line of where your edging is that you're trying to recreate. And that, folks, is it for our Crazy Eights quilt. So let me move Lucy all the way to the other end and we'll talk for just a second more about the pink measuring tape. So this is kind of a recap of what I covered at the beginning. I'm not sure where is the best way to put her out of camera, Dave? That's pretty good right there. That's pretty decent. Okay. So talking about um, the pink tape measure, which I've got attached here. This is a, it's a long armor's tape measure. And um, just fudging the cameras here. Which camera? We're staying on this one? There we are. Hi, everybody. Okay, so it is a long armor's tape measure. Got mine off Amazon. And it has a zero in the middle and measures one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., out to both edges. I don't necessarily use that. As I showed at the beginning, I don't particularly center my quilt. I just span the tape measure across my long arm. I've got it attached at both ends. I've just got little pinchy office clips holding a loop onto each rail. And I make it as level as I can so that I've got a nice horizontal line here. So I use that horizontal line to gauge the straightness of my piecing and quilt. And I use the measurements, the increments on the tape measure every time I advance the quilt so that it stays the same width all the way down. So I just make note of what the measurement is on the right, what the measurement is on the left. And every time I advance the quilt, I double check those measurements and make adjustments. This quilt was fairly straight to begin with, fairly square. It just had bias edges, so I just manipulated a little bit here and there to keep it square. If you have a quilt that is not square, I encourage you to go back and watch my episode that is, I think the design is Coffee Beans and Wavy Borders is in the title. And it talks about how to deal with quilts that have narrower and wider areas and lots of rippling and excess fabric, and I go into that in some length. Okay, any more questions or comments? Penny. What quilting design do you find is the hardest or most challenging, and what design is the easiest for beginners? Ooh, good question. <laughs> Boy, there's so many out there. I'll tell you one thing I do think is that meandering is not the easiest. That seems to be people's go-to when they say, I don't free motion quilt, I just meander. Meandering is not the easiest design to quilt, in my humble opinion. One of my favorites would be double loops, and I'm pretty sure you can find that in earlier Live and Unscripted episodes too. The reason I prefer a loop to meandering is because you're kind of always moving in the same direction. There's no changing of directions. That's why meandering is hard, honestly. So I think that'd be a good one to start with. Single loops or double loops? Yeah. We have a question. Oh, a stump me question. Okay, hang on, I have to get a tissue, folks. Sorry about the drippy nose, it's a real nuisance. Okay, a stump me question. Go for it. Penny, here's my stump question. What stumps you? Well, do you know what? I alluded to it earlier. A pantograph stumps me. I have never quilted a pantograph. And I mean, I guess it's not that I don't think I could, but it's a whole other skill set, right? To learn how to line up the paper pattern and get your needle so that you're quilting from the back of your machine and you know where it is and what it's doing. So pantographs kind of stump me, quite honestly. Good one. Any more comments? That's it? Great. Well, you guys have been a fun audience. Um, if you're watching this in form of a replay, feel free to still type in comments. I will see them and I will get back um, and answer you. If you're enjoying these episodes, I encourage you to hit the like and subscribe button. And if you're willing, watch some episodes all the way through to bump up my hours a little bit. I'm just getting really close to that 4,000 hour threshold on YouTube, which would be really cool. Like and subscribe. Um, what else? Don't forget to have a listen to my podcast, which comes out every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Last week's was a, fr a local friend 
who um, did some remarkable things in making masks during the pandemic. And that also translated into a quilt and appearing in the news and some fun stuff. So that's a good one. And this coming week, I have an author of a children's book. It's a fable in fabric. And her name is Trudy Cowan. And that will be a really enjoyable one, too. So yeah, podcast. Um, it's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. And a new episode comes out each Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So Hope to see you there, and thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure, and I will see you the first Monday in September.